Test. Can you hear me? Is that all right? Okay. Uh, Dale, just let me know if it's uh, too much, if it's too breathy, or I think it still sounds. There's still a bit of that, right? Hang on, hang on. Let me let me adjust this. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Hmm? He, he can still hear it. On your on your headphones, eh? No. Uh, uh. Okay. Well, thank God for Okay, thank God for this church, for okay, your pastor, and also for the lovely, wonderful, and very warm fellowship that I've always uh, enjoyed here with, among the brethren. All right, and um, you know, coming here is always very special to me, and uh, it's definitely a, a joy being here with you, having fellowship, and also just uh, having the privilege to minister God's word. Okay, and as I mentioned before, you know. Uh, it's always an encouragement to see that there's constant change and improvement, all right? And you know, change is not a bad thing, all right? As long as we're improving, we're uh, you know progressing uh, scripturally, and we're growing, and uh, we're also improving the, the way things uh, we do things. Uh, you know, it ought not to be a bad thing. Uh, the problem today among independent Baptists is that we get so caught up with you know we mix up the idea of the old fashioned faith right in the word of God that's unchanging and we confuse that with being old fashioned as in being traditionalist one of the biggest debates that uh, came up re recently was the type of microphone we use and apparently we Deal with your the, the the wireless, right? So apparently the old-fashioned independent Baptist say that you're not supposed to use this kind of mic. All right. Uh, then I wonder what what the all the old-time fundamentalists use because um, the only difference between this and the ones that they used to use was that it had a wire. But they say this is, you know, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's for singing centrally and, and whatever. And then now they say, oh, this one, I, I actually have a, I downloaded a video of this independent Baptist preacher saying this is uh, for, you know, this is a sissy mic. <laughs> now, I'm also a technical guy, so can I say this? We use this because it keeps a constant fixed location so that if I turn my head this way or that way, you don't lose the sound and then the deal there will panic. Why? Because when we use the clip-on lapel mic, the problem is that if I turn my head, the sound disappears. And can I say this? You know, either way, those were not the microphones that Spurgeon used or Noah. And we get into f fighting big battles now about things that don't have anything to do with the scriptures. And then we ignore, we ignore the clear counsel of scripture. And then we say we're biblicists. And you know something, among, among these independent Baptist churches, seriously, we're in trouble. We're in trouble because we no longer uh, concern ourselves with what's important. All right? So let's turn our Bibles and uh, I'm just going to go. We're going to walk in a few places, so just follow with me. But let's go to Romans chapter 13. Okay? And we're, we're now, like I said, we're big on this big issue about microphones. Uh, whether the preacher is allowed to have a beard, okay? Otherwise, he's, he has a beard. He's not allowed to preach. And then, what about John the Baptist and Jesus? I mean, they all had beards, and it's like, what? Where, where did we get this from? Okay, because that that was dictated by culture, 
Okay, and American presidents, I think up to around the 1930s, had beards, or 1920s, 1930s, they had beards, and then they stopped. And now we're saying that uh, that is the mark of whether or not you're a spiritual man or whether you're really a man of God or not. And, uh, you know, the prophets of old, uh, do you remember that the priests who ministered in the temple and the tabernacle all had beards? That's why the oil ran down their beards. You know, and, and now whether or not we use this or this, can I say this? I have both. And we want to get into the competition. I have more printed Bibles than a lot of preachers. Okay? And some of them even have goat skin leather. But this is this is ridiculous, right? So let's get into the word of God and we're going to spend some serious time in it and let's not okay, let's not uh, be ridiculous like all these other people and let's get into serious stuff. Okay? So uh, let's do this. Um let's all stand. All right, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. Uh, we'll do this responsively. I'll start the first verse, you do the, you, you do the next verse, right? The first seven verses. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. Right, verse 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. All right, together, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. May God bless to us the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, for gathering us here. And our Lord, I thank you for the, the time that we can just come to worship you and then for the sweet fellowship. And now, Lord, I pray you give us our attentive hearts, our Lord, tender hearts and minds that we be ready to hear even the teaching and preaching of your word. I pray and ask for your mighty hand and our Lord, for thy empowerment. Fill me in thy spirit and our Lord, use me as thy instrument. As, as your messenger and uh, Lord there is nothing of myself that I, I can offer that can be of a help Lord but it's your word and your, your, the scriptures that we want to do you, deal with today Lord give us discernment and understanding and I pray Lord uh, that uh, our hearts will be just tender to hear what you have to say and Lord um, just use me and uh, Lord help me that I can be of a help blessing strong encouragement even to all the blessed folks here, Lord. And uh, Lord, we thank you. We just come, it's time to you in Christ's name, pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. Okay, now Romans chapter 13. Um, I think the last time I was here, I did spend some time in Romans chapter 12, right? And I told you that there was a pattern um, beginning with the, okay, how in the first three chapters that man, all right, uh, is in trouble with a holy and righteous God but then God offers a way out that uh, by faith that the righteousness of God is available all right, to sinful men. Verse four, uh, chapter 4 and 5 then talks about how this is by imputation and by faith. Right? By faith we trust God's promise. God will transfer the righteousness of Christ to us, to our account. Why? Because not even our righteousness is good enough. Right? And we're in trouble because of that. And this is a very important message, especially in Cambodia, uh, places like Cambodia, where many believe that they can be good enough and they, by their righteousness to stand before God. Now, then, uh, you know, chapter 6, 7, and 8 are very important chapters for the believer because after we're saved, what happens is this, that um, we are now set free. Right? Free from the power of sin, free to say no to sin, but there will be a struggle, which is what, was, uh, what Paul documented in chapter 7. But then in chapter 8 and then in Galatians, we see the key to being free in Christ and to f walk uh, in righteousness 
but not by the works of our own flesh. You and I cannot do this by our own effort. Okay, it will have to be by the working of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, then we, we move on, and then when we get to chapter 12, what happens is that it begins with the individual, right? How that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to dedicate ourselves, right? We have a term for this, we call this consecration. Right, we sing, take my life and let it be what? Consecrated Lord to thee. It's a whole dedication. I'm giving my life away because I cannot purchase or pay for my salvation, but I can pay it forward by now giving my all for my Lord and my Savior. So then after we talk after it talks about that, then you see that the next verses in chapter twelve deals with what? how we can use those spiritual gifts in the context of serving the Lord and being a blessing to one another within the local New Testament church. Right? We use those gifts, okay? but now when we come to chapter 13, then it, the scope continues to expand because now then it deals with, what about you and I? Right? As citizens of heaven, as the saints, as members of the local New Testament church, we reside in a country, in a city, in this world, Right? where there are civil, uh, there is a civil authority and secular powers, how do we respond to that? How do we deal with that? How do we take up our part? You know, do we, uh, and so here, beginning with chapter uh, 13, verse 1, it says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Every one, it says there's no exception. All right, unto the higher powers. Now, then it tells us, for there is no power but of God. Okay, all power, all authority uh, comes from God, derives from the Lord. Can I use this? Okay. Um, and it says, but they are, okay, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be, right? Those powers that exist that are ordained of God. Example, the government. Okay, now it tells us here that God has established this. Now, God first authority unfortunately whether you, maybe many of us think of it that way unfortunately in the hands of fallible imperfect men all right human authority okay now this is true whether it's of parents parents you know that right how many times we fail even when we deal with our children right young people you know growing up our moms and dads you know they have issues um, that is true of all human authority, even of pastoral authority. Okay, they're fallible. They they have their constraints, their limitations. They do have their faults. But it tells us, be subject to these powers. All right. Verse two. Verse two says, "Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God." Be very careful. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. This is not talking about eternal judgment, whatever, but uh, it has to do with that, the fact that this authority has the power to punish. Okay? Now, look at verse 3, because the reason is given to us. It says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. <coughs> Alright? The rulers, now, it, it can come in many forms. Now, during that time, uh, they had a Roman emperor. Okay? Other nations had kings. Okay? Uh, the Greeks had a democratic form of government, an elected government. Okay? From which you will see in the New Testament church uh, many of the things, right, in terms of the model or governance of the New Testament church uh, seem to be very similar, okay? It's very democratic in, in style. Now, it says here, they are not a terror to good works. Say, but to the evil. So the question here was this, will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have, the pr have praise of the same. Right? He said, do good, right? These powers are not a terror to good works, okay? Notice, it, it honors God-fearing people who live 
in obedience to the Lord should never have to fear their government. All right, you do good. You notice the emphasis is on what we do good, right? And then we obey that. Why? Why is that the case? Because look at verse four. It says the reason is this: for he is the minister of God to thee for good. Okay, it's a minister. The, the purpose of human government, right, is to uphold good, punish evil. All right, he says, but if thou do that which is evil, he be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Notice, here is the New Testament answer, even concerning the death sentence. Okay, that there is the rightful use of that that power and authority to punish evil. All right, he says, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. One of the things you're going to see here is that in the New Testament, there is no, it doesn't say anything about that, oh, the death sentence is wrong, it's evil, or whatever, we need to do away with it. In fact, you will see here that it reaffirms that that power, that authority is vested in civil government. All right? You don't hear anything in the New Testament concerning that the death sentence was evil or bad, that Jesus Christ was, okay, that crucifixion was wrong. What you do here was this, that the apostles in the book of Acts in Jerusalem charged the Jewish, the Jewish people and authorities with killing Christ. Okay? It, it was by their unrighteous judgment and the mockery of a trial that they put, sentenced Jesus Christ to death. But here you'll see, they did not say, oh, okay, let's do away with it. Paul and just about every one of the apostles was executed one way or another. Okay? They did that to John, except that he survived. They tried to boil him in oil. Okay? He didn't die. He lived out the rest of his life all right, in exile before he died on, uh, in, on the island of Patmos. But here you notice, it, they're a minister of God. Now, by the way, that, the context of this Includes the Roman government, all right? Includes kings. Paul told us that we were to pray for all, for kings and all who are in authority. Okay, which ought to be one of the priority items at every prayer meeting. Okay, so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life. Okay. In fact, let me see if we can turn to that passage. Uh, okay, First Timothy chapter two. I'm just going to read this. Uh, I exhort therefore that first of all, ex- supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All, all right. It says, in including who? Verse two says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, so what do we do? We're, we're supposed to, as citizens living in this world and, and in the nations that we're in, and all that. It says, um, supplications. Pray for God to supply the needs. All right. Pray for the, uh, the these people. Intercede. Give thanks. For who? For kings and all that are in authority. All right, but I didn't vote for him. You pray for them. I don't like the guy. Then you pray for him. All right? Why? So that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Because if you don't do that, what happens? It's a, there, now, you will see uh, there is an interesting principle here, which I, I believe uh, goes back to our Baptist roots here because it's that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, one of the things that we want to do, make sure is this, you know, that we, well, where there is no connection and we're to keep a, maintain a separation between church and state. In particular, it is that to keep the state and government out of church. Okay? So that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Why? We don't have to go through deceit or camouflage when we go underground. I don't have to lie to anyone in order to 
come to we, for us to come together as a church. We don't have to put outside a big sign that says this is actually a uh, gym on the outside, but actually we're meeting here. Now, as we pray for them, all right, we keep so that it doesn't intrude also into this. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Do you see that? It's good and acceptable before God. We should do this. He said, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, that means, it includes, like I said, you don't like the guy, are you praying for that politician to be saved? Yeah. Well, I didn't vote for him. Pray for him. He says, why? Because God... The Lord wants this, who will have all men, all means all, to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Why? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and, uh, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, so going back to Romans 13, it tells us here that, look, they, they, these, these civil powers, now, it is a minister of God. They represent God. Do you realize they serve God's purpose? Okay, minister means what? Servant. Okay, they serve God's purposes to, to revenge, to bring revenge and execute wrath on all those that do evil. Now, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath's sake, but also for conscience sake. Now, there were two reasons here that we must be subject to these powers. One says, not just for wrath's sake. Why? Because if you offend the law, you will be punished. The wrath of the law and all that, that authority will come down upon you. That's why we're not to be evildoers, we're not to be thieves, we're not to be all these things, and, you know. But secondly, it says for, concerning a good conscience towards God, this is the right thing to do. All right? Render, so verse 6 and 7 says, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Okay? whether you're paying your taxes and, and all that, right? we pay tribute. They so render therefore to all their dues. Who? You render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, you render to God what belongs to God. Okay? The part that I don't like in our modern day life is that when it comes pastor, to income tax, the government says that they want to take that first before I even get a chance to give it to the Lord. They put themselves in first place. All right, but here the issue is as to rendering to the government what is due. There is no question about that. You render to, okay, to them what is due. Said to tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear. Talking about what reverence and respect and honor. It says fear to whom fear, to honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Okay. Now that includes in other words. Uh, being okay, honest people, lights in a dark world, right? A p peculiar people, okay, even in this world. But the question for us is this Where does it say that I'm to do this only if the government is good? It doesn't say that. Where does it say only if I like the president? Is this all? Because do you realize that throughout scriptures in the Old and New Testament, many times God's people lived under wicked kings and wicked rulers. But we are still to obey and to follow the law. Now, are there exceptions? Okay, so good question here. Are there exceptions to that? The exception comes when you and I are forced to obey civil authority over what God had commanded. Okay? Where we've been commanded to disobey God so that we can obey men. Okay? Now, don't use that as the rule for how we should do all things. But realize this, that there, is, there are certain exceptions. Why? Because there is a hierarchy. God comes first. God who then grants authority to humans, the civil authority, 
But what happens is that we are to obey that authority. Why? Because that authority and power comes from God. But where there is a contradiction, we go back to the up the chain of command. God, whatever God has commanded to us, we obey. Okay? But I want us to realize here that human government has its role to play and we play our role as members of the New Testament church as saints all right in a world in the world today we are part of all that okay and we're to, we're to obey we're to submit to that uh, not just for wrath but also for conscience sake okay because they represent God and his authority they are ministers his servants now if we don't like certain people and all that what did Paul tell right to Timothy he said pray for them why because it's God's will he his will is he will have all men to be saved okay so we should pray now like I said Here's the problem. We Christi- many, many times Christians, I think, make the mistake of doing this. We pray for, okay, well, I like the current president, so we pray for him. But I don't like the, some of the opposition. No, you, you should, in fact, all the more, I think you should pray for those. All right? Pray for those. Why? Because the scripture tells us that the heart of a king is in God's hands. Okay, and then it says like the rivers of water, God can turn it in any direction He wants, you know. Do you realize that when you look at a river, the waters can change direction over time and God, can, God says He can direct that. If He can direct that, you and I can appeal to our Heavenly Father, right, for the power to change a heart. Okay, to change a person's heart. Now, this, this, this is useful even for what? in all our relationship problems, all right, whether among brethren, okay, sometimes it's uh, parents, okay, God can turn that heart. Okay, now, let's turn to all right, turn to Acts chapter 4. Okay, we see here that uh, Peter and John were arrested and detained and then brought before the, the rulers and the elders and the scribes in verse 5. Okay, John, Acts chapter 4, verse 5 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, right, they were brought before them for questioning. They asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? Right, referring to that miracle that they had performed, okay, on the man who was, uh, was lame. Now, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, right, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the important man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucify whom God raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here before you whole you notice here they were brought to question say what authority do you have to preach All right what authority do you have how you know what happened here with this man who was sitting there by the temple he was unable to walk now he said look Notice Peter's answer was by, by the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? He now answers here, and he has no prepared sermon for this. Okay? But by the filling of the Holy Spirit, he points out to them, he confronts them, he says, by the name of Jesus Christ, this is how, why this man is standing before you healed. And by the way, it is an amazing miracle. Because not only was he able to stand up and walk, Think about this. All his life, he never stood up. He was never able to walk. In an instant, his muscles, which had wasted away all his life, gained strength. The bones, which by this time, if he were to stand up suddenly, most likely would have fractured. 
He's not been doing any weight gaining, uh, sorry, not any load bearing exercise at all. His, his bones would have been very brittle. He stood up immediately with strength. He was able to stand up, walk. He was leaping. His brain instantaneously was able to coordinate his body so that he could walk and he could jump. You look at every one of our babies here, you know, you know how many months it takes them to learn to stand up, walk, and then eventually to run, and then to jump. And then while they're learning to walk, what do they do? They're unsteady and plop, and they go down, face down. He did that instantaneously by the power of God. Right? Peter now confronts them, says, you were the ones says, whom ye crucify, Jesus Christ. By his power, this man now stands before you whole. He says, this is the stone which is set at naught of you builders. Now, what did Peter do? Comparing scripture with scripture, he cross-references the Old Testament. He points out, this is this stone was set at naught he says, by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Right? Right? What's Christ is the foundation stone says neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved it's only one name under heaven right there's only one way wow now when they saw the boldness of peter and, and john and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men they marveled Says, these guys were fishermen. Which Bible school did they graduate from? Hmm? No doctorate, no degree. <laughs> right? They didn't go to school. That's why they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marvel and, and and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, this ought to be more important than the number of Bible college degrees you have. The time we spend with Jesus, the time we spend with the Lord, the time we spend with the Scriptures, studying, right? And look at verse 14, and beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could not say anything against it. You know, there was no way of refuting these, these two. And plus, the witness was very clear. This man stands there now where once everybody knew he could never walk. Okay, this guy is ready to run and jump around. All right, now they have a problem because verse fifteen. But when they commanded them to go outside, aside of the out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, "What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all." All right, it says that a notable miracle that was done by them is very clearly seen and known to everyone. Everyone saw it. They cannot deny it did not happen. All right? Manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Okay? Is it? But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. All right? It says they don't want this news to spread because this is amazing. And the news is going to go viral. All right? But they say, okay, let's threaten them, tell them. Stop, you're not going to report this, you're not going to repeat this to anyone, and that's it. So verse 18, this is what they do now. It says, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Okay? Two things you, you can see here already in this chapter was what? Uh, one, they were questioned on the fact that they had no authority to do this, these things. Now they are told, we are going to tell you what you can preach about and what you cannot preach about. And it says that you're not going to teach in the name of Jesus. Okay? Now, what, what, what were the, did the high priest and all these uh, people say? They're saying this. Okay? You can be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can have your prayer meeting. You can gather. But do not preach publicly in the name of Jesus. Okay? So what will a good Baptist do? Because these, I'm, now, 
They don't. They did not necessarily. The New Testament Church did not necessarily start and saying, you know, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. But I want us to recognize the Baptist principle here because the authority came from the Scriptures. The authority also came from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says he told them what all power is given to you. Go ye therefore and what. Teach all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, right? Now here, is it okay? You're not supposed to speak the name of Jesus. You can preach anything else you want. Just don't mention Jesus. Don't teach in His name. Look at verse 19. This is how they responded. But G- Peter and John answered and said unto them, "Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye." Okay, the point here he is making is this: Why should I listen to you more than I listen to God? Now this makes it very clear: God's authority and the authority of the Scriptures are higher than man's authority. Now it is not one or the other, but where there is going to be a conflict and a choice, we side with God and His authority over the authority of man. Okay, but we must harmonize the scriptures because Romans thirteen makes it very clear we we are to be subject to the powers. Okay, and if you resist, there will be problems. Okay, now are there going to be situations where we find ourselves in a conflict? That we must disobey civil authority, and throughout the scriptures you're going to see over and over again, yes. And when that happens, it, the answer is very clear: we choose God first. Okay. Now the answer was not found in like, well, the solution to all this is that we need to make sure that we have a Christian government. Or that we put in as many Christians as possible into public office. I'm not saying you can't do that, but I'm saying that's not the solution. That's not the key. Okay. But it doesn't forbid that because otherwise Paul would contradict himself. He says, you know, to pray for all those who are in authority, right? And it's God's will that who will have what all men to be saved. Okay, but that is not the given solution. We pray for them, we obey the authority, but where there we are forced to disobey God, we always choose to obey the Lord, even if it costs us something, even if there are con- consequences. Because here, this is for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So, verse twenty-one. So, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for what、uh, that which was done. Okay. So, what happens? Well, if you read on in the、uh, the rest of the chap, the next few chapters, what did they do? They went back and did exactly the same thing again. Okay, they were arrested. <laughs> Put in prison, right? Question, and then what happens? Release. They go back out again. And in fact,、uh, because of the power of God, and it was so evident that、um, the people, all the people saw. When you get to the later chapter, I think it was、uh, in chapter five, you're going to see that.、Uh, in fact, after they re- arrested the apostles and then released them, they、uh, go- were going to arrest them again. They were afraid of the people because the, they were afraid that the people might stone them. The authorities realized they were on the wrong side of the issue. Okay. You turn to、uh, chapter six. All right. Yes,、oh, sorry. Chapter five. I, I was. Okay. 
Chapter 5, you notice verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's temple. And of the, of the rest, does no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. All right now, uh, there they were, and then what happened was this verse 17, uh, the beginnings of uh, soft persecution. Because we see here, then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Verse 18, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They were in prison again. And by the way, the uh, high priest and the Sadducees, they would be, have been the theological liberals and modernists today. Okay? But here they were put in prison. All right? But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to all the people, all the, to the people, all the words of this life. And guess what? The angel of the Lord opened the prison door, set them free, and said, you go back out into the open, right, where, interestingly, everyone can see you, where you can be arrested again. And what did they do? They did, it. They did exactly that. Okay? They were being summoned, and then verse 22, were, but when the officers came and found them not in prison, they returned and told saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Can you imagine? They said, the whole prison, there was no breach. Security was there. The guards were there. The doors were locked. However, when we went in, we couldn't find anybody. They disappeared. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of themselves where unto this would go grow. All right, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Hey, didn't we tell them not to do that? We imprisoned them, and then guess what? They're out there doing it again. You can't keep. Do you realize you cannot stop the word of God from being preached? And, and while men, we may be imprisoned for this, whatever, you know what? It's not, it's, God will find a way. Determine one thing, even if it should mean that we end up in prison, then I'm, I guess God just wants me to start a prison ministry from the inside. Now, they were going to arrest them again, but look at verse 26. Then when the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, they told them, can you just please come with us? We'd like to talk to you. All right, please just come along nicely. Is it without violence? Why? For they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. Remember, it wasn't that long ago, these people were hostile towards all the disciples of Jesus Christ. But in that con persistent, patient ministry, as they continued to preach, and they saw the power of God, whoever, you know, on the ground, people were starting to change in their viewpoint. Now, if they had gone out to arrest them, instead of applauding and saying, yeah, get them, you know, hang them, you know, execute them, whatever, now they were, the authorities were afraid that they could be stoned. But notice the consistency of the disciples and the apostles because they kept on preaching even when now the authority said, no, we will not allow you to do this. Why? Because this authority that we have comes from God, not from men. Okay? And even if it means imprisonment, I believe uh, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, now he, in rejecting, okay, he refused to apply, and he was requested actually, he was given the chance, he returned down the offer to apply for a license to preach the word of God under the authority of the Church of England. And he spent at least 10 years in prison for that. Okay, Separated from his wife and his daughter who grew up blind. Okay, He rejected that. Okay, why? Because this authority comes from, from the Lord. 
okay and here it may be that we may not have uh, the high priest and the seducees or all these telling us what to do but you know among us today we we have a whole bunch of big big name preachers who will dictate what we can or cannot preach and can I say this our authority comes from here not from anybody else okay and that means the word of God must be unfettered must be the policy or the principle we must have is to unleash this and let the word of God say what it says not men dictating to us what the word of God says okay now sometimes the ones who dictate that could be sitting in the pew pastor you shouldn't you shouldn't deal with this you know I don't like it pastor when you preach about this okay now the question we must ask is is it scriptural if it's scriptural then let's say all that it has to say but let's not just pick and choose only our favorite subjects and topics all right let's cover everything okay now what happens if we don't have the power we're forced to choose well let's look at Daniel because Daniel and his friends they had a few different ways of responding to it all right very quickly if you turn to Daniel chapter 1 what I want to see here is that um, okay this very familiar passage verse 8 it says but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat not with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuch that he might not defile himself now home in on the word requested now Daniel understood one thing okay he was under authority okay and, and he has no rights hardly any rights he and all the rest were captives in Babylon okay right now they are being put into some sort of competition to see who the king will pick to be his servants and his advisors. All right, think of it as like a survival game to see who will be the final 10 that they will pick. It's just slightly better than a slave in his case. But notice, what did he do? He tried to work with the authority. He requested. Notice that? Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. All right? He didn't say, what is this rubbish that you're feeding me? What is this thing? All right? This is not uh, kosher. This is not, uh, you know, this is forbidden. I'm not going to eat this slop. All right? This, is, this food is ungodly. Uh, no. He, he said, okay, he requested that he might not defile himself. And notice this. God can and will grant favor. Because verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Alright? Now, so, and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who had appointed your meat and your drink. Right? Now, he, his job is to make sure that Daniel and all these people are taken care of. That they will be healthy. Okay? They're not just healthy. They, they're given the, actually the best food. Alright? It says, if you... It says here, For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your son? It says, what if the king sees and then you, you look, you're looking pale, you're looking haggard, you're looking you know, frail, uh, you don't look as you know, nice and pink and rosy like, like the others? It says, then ye shall make me endanger my head to the king. It says, the king's going to have my head for this. Yeah, I have a job to do. Daniel, please understand. What did Daniel do? Okay. He amended his proposal and said, let's do a trial. You see how we, this is what adults do. Okay. We grow up, as we grow up, you know, we, one of the things we learn is this, we don't throw a tantrum. We don't, no, this is what I want. We propose, we negotiate, we counter propose. Right? He made a proposal here, he said, okay. 
Then said Daniel to Melza, whom the prince of the eunuchs has set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Okay, let's put let's do a trial run, ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Okay? It's more or less a vegetarian diet, actually. Right? It says, then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children they eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. Now, you know what? What did Daniel say in verse 13? Okay, you put it to the test. End of ten days, you do a comparison. All right? Now, it says, if you compare how the other uh, children look and then comp uh, versus us, then it says, you decide. Notice this. It says, as thou seest, deal with thy servants. What, did, what was Daniel prepared to do? He says, you put it to a trial, you test it, you see the results for yourself, okay? You decide, you do what is best. Okay? Now, what Daniel is saying implicitly here is this. I will agree to submit to this. You see that? Okay? Now, when you turn to chapter 3, on the other hand, you'll see here that where there was a very clear commandment from the Lord not to have any other gods and not to bow down to other gods, what happened? <coughs> Daniel's friends drew a very clear line and resorted to civil disobedience. Okay? Civil disobedience. No, now notice in chapter 3. Okay? I'll just jump to verse 4. And then and Herod cried aloud to you it is commanded all people, nations and languages. So this, this is a decree from the king to what? Everybody. That at what time we hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. All right? This huge golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It says you bow down, you worship him, you worship this, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth. Notice. All right? This is not just to bow or pay respect. This is to worship this. Shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So what did the people do? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had gathered all his, all those in government service, all the government officers together, in the, throughout his kingdom, he gave this, passed this decree. All right? Now, verse 7 says, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages, Right, so it tells us here all the different people groups, the nations, and then all those of representing every language in the kingdom. Right, it's a very multinational king empire. Fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Look at verse 8. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, oh, King, live forever. Thou, O king, has made the decree that every man that shall hear the blah, 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 whatever, repeats. And verse 11 says, And whoso not falleth not down and worshipeth, that he shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Now, notice the word, certain Jews. Why? Because the rest of them bowed down and worshipped that idol. Okay? Majority of them bowed down. Why? It's good for them. They get to stay alive. Right? Staying alive is good. It might help their promotion. But this is, but certain Jews, right? 
whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Right? So they were summoned before the king, right? And he asked them, why, you, why did not they uh, do this? Now, look at verse 14 and 15. Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, notice suddenly, this is not just about the golden image any, anymore. It would seem like, based on the accusations, they have reported, it was reported also that they do not serve any of the gods that Nebuchadnezzar have, has. Okay, this was known about them by the accusers. In other words, by the way, in other words, that's their testimony. Everyone knew about it. All right, and he says here. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast into the same cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, time out here. Why is the king saying this again? Do you realize that these men, in keeping to their convictions, and they stood there when everyone else bent and they bowed and they worshipped this image. And they stood up straight. They were accused. They were brought before the king, right? The king broke his own law. Why? What, was, what did the law say? That same hour, if you don't bow down and worship the image, you will be immediately cast into the furnace. What did the king say? I'm giving you one more chance. Who changed his convictions? Hmm? Who changed his convictions? The king. Do you realize the law was very specific? Immediately, no, no second chance. This is a zero tolerance policy. All right? The moment you disobey, you, you fry. And then the king says, okay, I'll give you one more chance. The music and all that is going to play one more time. Right? You join in our praise and worship session. You bow down and worship. Otherwise, I will put you into the furnace. And it says, there is no, who is that God? And there's no God that will deliver you. Who changed? It's the king. When he did that, what happened? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this, manner, in this matter, if so, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O God, O, o King. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now I read a book uh, some years ago concerning uh, this issue of convictions. Now, a conviction is something that is not negotiable. It cannot be changed with pressure, under threat of death, right? Or that under financial pressure that it changes. If it can change, that's not a conviction. Okay? Now, they said, if God delivers us from this fire, if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down and worship this image. Right? So, can we respectfully decline? Okay? But think about this, no? In taking that stand of disobedience, what happened was this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already made the king change his conviction. The law said you die immediately, and he says, I'm going to give you another chance. And they said, no, no thank you. All right? Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage, in other words, his face, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which tells me prior to that, 
the countenance of King Nebuchadnezzar towards these three men was very favorable. Okay? It was very favorable. Now, think about this because we also run into the problem of today among believers of uh, pragmatism. Pragmatism would have said, look, the king gave you another chance. Why are you being so unreasonable? Hmm? You almost got yourself killed. Surely you would have learned your lesson by now. Why do you have to do this? Right? Why do you have to take up this stand? Right? Why do you have to take up this fight? And what did they do? They said, thank you king, but no thanks. Why? Going back to where we were in Acts just now, we would rather obey God than men. Right? Now, remember up to that point, they were willing to follow, willing to submit, willing to obey. But when it came to having to make a choice whether to obey men and then disobey God, then the answer was very clear. Even if it meant losing their lives. Now, the argument pragmatism would have said, look, why must you three people be so special? Didn't the rest of your Jews bow down and worship the idol? Haven't you heard that before? Look, other churches, other Christians don't have an issue. Why do you have an issue with this? Because God said so. All right, as long as the scriptures are very clear on the matter, then we know which side we're supposed to land on the issue, period. Now, can we have a bad spirit? Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't, didn't go around and say, King, you know what? That, that dumb statue and, and image that you put up there, whatever, we're not going to bow down to it. They didn't do that. Okay, but they did respectfully tell the king, look, you can put us into the burning fiery furnace. If God's going to deliver us, he will. You can't do anything about it, king. But if he won't, it's still not going to change what, our decision here. All right, so what happens now? It says, the king now was full of fury, verse 19, all right, and he commanded that they should heat the furnace of the... Uh, Okay, the heat for this one seven times more than it was want to be heated. All right, he says, okay, now this, this is where it gets interesting to heat the furnace seven times greater than what it usually would, the temperature would be. Now, the king went from being favorable and offering even a second chance to Shadrach, Misha, and Benegal to now saying, you know what? I hate you people so much. I'm not just going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. I make sure that you're going to suffer a terrible death. That's why he says he wants the temperature now to be seven times more. But remember who compromised? Nebuchadnezzar. All right? Now, you know the rest of the story, so we're not going to dwell on that, but turn a few chapters down. to chapter 6. Now, look at verse 1. It says, It pleased Darius. Now, this is under new king and new, administra uh, okay, new administration. Right? And this would be under the Persian Empire now, not, not the Babylonian Empire. Okay? And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first right so there were 120 princes three presidents on top all right of the three Daniel was the the highest second in command others to uh, before the king okay so you get the picture here now why was that the case it says then this Verse 3, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, by the way, he's not in a Christian nation. 
He is not in Israel. But notice something, you know, he maintained an excellent spirit in spite of that. He has to deal with, there will be constant battles all the time. Choosing to do what would please the Lord versus discharging his job. But they always found an excellent spirit in him. Right? And the king taught to set him over the whole realm. Now, this would not go down well with certain people. And notice, then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find, not, they, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Now, if there is an example of, uh, of a believer who was in public office as a government servant, was Daniel. Who was, had an excellent spirit. He was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now, why these two verses? These men were looking to take Daniel down. And with politicians, what do we find? If you dig hard enough, you're going to find something to accuse them with. Okay? You just have to dig deep enough, you're going to find some dirt. They dug and they dug and they dug and they could not find anything. No fault. All right? Nothing to accuse Daniel of. He did not even take one roll of toilet paper home from the office. Huh? Wow. They could, is it, they could not find any occasion against Daniel. Now, verse 5 tells us they finally figured out, okay, here's how we get him into trouble. All right, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now, what were they saying? The only way was this. We put him into a conflict right, between obeying God and obeying the laws of this land. So what happens? Well, the next few verses tells us that uh, they got the king to pass a law that whosoever will pray to any God except to the king. Why? Because the king is a God. Okay? If he, anyone in the next 30 days should pray to any other God, then said, therefore he will be put to death, all right? will be cast into the den of lions. Verse 6. All right? It says, Now, King, O King, verse 8, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Why? Notice, here, the Medes and the Persians believe that what? The kings are divine. They are infallible. So when they sign the decree, there is no correcting or amending that because why? They never make a mistake. Reminds me of some Baptist pastors. You know how arrogant man is, you know, we claim divinity and we claim divine powers and infallibility. Now, Verse 10, so in other words, the plot was this. Set up a situation, and the world understands this principle. You set up a situation where the believer will find himself in conflict. All right, where he either has to obey and submit to the laws of the land or to God. And that's when we will nail him. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the written, writing was signed, what did he do? He went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled down, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave, gave, gave thanks before his God. Notice this, as he did a four time. What was Daniel's response? The law may have changed. It's business as usual. I'm still going to do what I've always been doing as he did a four time. Okay? 
Verse 14, the accusations were brought before the king. Look at verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these things, was so displeased with himself. You know, when you have an excellent spirit and a solid testimony, all right, an impeccable character, You know what happened? Even the king himself. He, the king is not a believer. But when the king realized what happened, that he was used by these men to set up Daniel, he was very displeased with himself. He says, and he says, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Can you imagine the king himself was consulting with his advisors and lawyers to find a way out? to get Daniel released. Because why? All this time, the reason they set this thing up was because he was found faithful. Never once compromised. Okay? They didn't find a weakness in him. You know, for some, they have a weakness for wine. Some have a weakness for money. Some have a weakness in their pride and if you flatter them the right way, you know, they will help you out. Some have a weakness for women. And here, they could not find anything and the only way was to set up a conflict. All right? Daniel has to choose one or the other. Obey God or obey man. And from when this happened all the way until the sun went down, what happens? The king himself was trying to find a way out to get Daniel released, but the king cannot disobey his own law. Right? That's why verse 15 tells us here, Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establishes may be changed. These other men had to go up and remind the king, King, I know what you're trying to do here, but let me remind you, your laws cannot, you cannot overturn this. All right? Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of, the, of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Even, you know, even the king trusted that you know, the God of Daniel can and will deliver him. Okay. Now, just want to turn to Acts chapter 19. All right, I'm going to read this and then uh, Paul went to Ephesus, okay, a Greek city. It's under the Roman Empire at the time, okay. It's a w wicked city, right, full of idolatry and immorality, right. It was a major spiritual center. People go to Ephesus to worship the goddess Diana. Right? It is the capital of Diana worship. Okay? She is a goddess of fertility. Okay? The, the statues, the idols of Diana picture her with okay, literally dozens of breasts all around her body. You can imagine that the worship of Diana involves sexual immorality, fornication. But this was a very major city, the center for this. Okay? Always amazes me that when I fly into Siem Reap that many, the majority of people coming here are not just merely tourists, but many are on a spiritual journey when they come to Siem Reap. Because of Uncle Wat. Okay? The airlines used to give out a, some airlines, I think they will give out a brochure to remind them of all those flying into Siem Reap, you are landing here and this is considered holy land. Okay? Now look at verse 22. The New Testament church there in Ephesus had some problems. It says, at the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, 
which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain onto the craftsmen. Right? Now, it tells us here, all right, there was someone who stirred up an issue. Okay? It says there was no, it arose no small stir. In other words, this was quite a big issue. All right? A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith. Now, what does he do? He's a craftsman. He makes silver shrines for Diana. Okay? For the worship of the goddess Diana. And we're told in verse 20, told here in verse 24 that it brought no small gain onto the craftsmen. They made a lot of money out of this. Okay? For their craftsmanship, for this beautiful work and whatever, they, it was a very profitable trade. Why? Because remember, it was the capital of Diana worship. The tourists who came would buy these shrines. Uh, the locals would buy all this. Now, verse 25 tells us whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. So he basically, this was like what you call today a guild hall meeting. All those who of the same profession, of the same trade, they came together, there was an association meeting, whatever, and then he gathered all of them and then spoke to them. He said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. So he makes it very clear, this is about money. We got rich doing this. Right? Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. Okay, so it was at this meeting that they accused Paul that because of his preaching, right, he said, turn away many people, saying what? These are not gods. Okay? These are not gods. He says, they are just made with hands. Right? Because they are made with hands, these are inanimate objects. Alright? These gods, you set them up, but if they were ever to fall down, you're going to have to help them to stand up again. These things made with human hands. And you're saying it's Paul's fault. All his preaching caused this problem. Look at verse 27. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and the magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Okay, he says, so because of this uh, Apostle Paul, all right, he says, our craft, all right, this train, okay, is being downgraded, despised by the world, despised by everyone, uh, is, our status is going down. So it's going to be sad and not. Not only that, it says this great temple of the goddess Diana, which is in Ephesus, this temple, okay, should become despised, her magnificence be destroyed. Now it says, now, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Now, think about what, you're, what they're saying here. Basically, what is Demetrius trying to say? Business is bad because of Paul and because of the church there at Ephesus. Okay? We're, gonna, we're losing business. The temple of Diana is losing her prominence because of that church and because of Paul. And when they heard these things, verse 28, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the more they cried out weapons, it spread. It says, and the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, okay, Paul's companions in travel, they caught all right, these two men, okay, Gaius and Aristarchus, all right, they're part of Paul's missionary team. They rush with one accord into the theater. They're going to put them on trial. And when Paul would have entered in onto the people, the disciples su suffered him not.
Now, there's going to be this whole assembly here, and the town clerk is going to tell them that they are in an illegal assembly. This is not a properly constituted meeting. I say they will be called into account one day for, for this, if this news were ever to tr come get out of Ephesus. He dismissed the meeting. So if there's going to be, if there is something, then let's have a proper due process and whatever to deal with it. But before we get to all this, I want us to think about this. These people said that their business was suffering. Right, the idol making business was suffering. They were, uh, they were fearful that they might go out of business. They were fearful that men will no longer go to the temple of Diana to worship. Why? Think about this. Why? Ask yourself. Was there a public campaign by the church? Was there a social movement? to get rid of the Diana worship. No. So what changed? Business went down because demand went down. Why did demand go down? Souls were getting saved. That as the preaching of the gospel went out throughout Ephesus, and Paul, by the way, stayed a number of years in Ephesus, patiently you know, preaching and preaching and, and more and more people got saved. You know what happened? As the momentum grew, with every person that gets saved and then baptized and now joins as a member of the New Testament church, okay? Paul testified in First Thessalonians chapter 1. What happened to the Thessalonians? How that they turn to God from idols. Picture of repentance. They turn to God but as they turned to God, they forsook the idols. It says, and then to serve the true and living God. With every person that got saved, they stopped worshipping the idols, and got rid of them. What happened? Business went down. Lack of demand. Not because there was public protest. All right? Not because they campaigned their local, their own politicians. They lobbied them to pass new laws to ban the sale of these things. Okay, realize this, you know, the New Testament church, their position is still going to be liberty for all. Man has free will and liberty. But God will judge them on how they use that also. Okay, but here is the thing. When you look at Ephesus, you have to realize something. No? There was great social change that happened in that city. How? People got saved. And when people got saved, their lives were transformed. Because of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of God unto salvation, what happened? It indirectly affected business not because Paul said okay members understand this we all sign and agree to the church covenant you will not go out there and buy all this now I know in the, among the Baptist church covenants we will have something right that we will not uh, engage in the sale and you know use of intoxicating drinks and you know and, and all this kind of stuff but you know something here there was no such commandment or instruction given other than the fact that they preached the word of God after these people were saved, instructed them to walk in the ways of God. Business suffered. To the point Demetrius now says, you know what, we need to do something about that church. They're creating trouble for all of us. Now, the false accusation was this. They, they said, Paul is going around telling everybody not to patronize our business. That's not true. Okay? Did he say that they are not gods? Yes. Right? But he did that indirectly because he was proclaiming the true and living God. Right? That on Mars Hill he said also that that, that God who created all men gave us life and breath and all these things says now commanded everywhere that all men should repent. Now, 
What happened was this. The, the, you're talking about this, that a one man and a church in a city. We're talking about a big city. Ephesus is not a small city. Was able to bring about great social change. How? One convert at a time. Without even having to directly actually deal with the issue of idols, okay, dedicated to the worship of Diana. Okay? The temple prostitutes would have found business went down. Why? People got saved. Their lives were changed. They were no longer going to the temples, no longer com- doing all these things. Okay? Now these people are angry. Now, what I want to point out to everyone here is that this is very different from what we see today. And, and in the years of, also even going back the centuries, in the years of Protestantism, okay, you don't have to go in to have a public or political campaign to shut down the gambling houses, the drunk houses, or the houses of prostitution. What do you do? You preach the gospel to everyone so that when they get saved, God does the work of transforming these lives so that they're never the same again. Okay? And guess what? You will, if, if we do that, you will get into trouble. Because why? It's going to affect business. The pimps are not going to be happy with you. The drug dealers are not going to be happy with you. Okay? We don't see that today. We're, now, today, what we're doing is this, where churches now have lost their vision for the power of God. We now turn to the power of the politician to make change. You see, the thing that bugs me, and I've questioned this many times, and I know uh, there also have been church members who got offended at me, was I said, why are we so concerned about what the lost peop- what lost people do? when we're not concerned about our own holiness before the Lord. Okay? I'm clear, sin is sin. The Bible makes it very clear what sin is. And there are many forms of sin. Okay? And yes, while you have the LGBTQ, you know, and all, you know, all, the, all the things that they do, but understand this, you know, It is hypocritical for us to focus on that and then not address the adulterers and the fornicators in church. Because Paul dealt with all of it in Romans chapter 1. Right? And it is not, you see, when we lose the vision for what the power of God onto salvation can do, then we turn to all other types of ways and means uh, to bring about change when, you know what, what we have with us is the most powerful instrument to bring change anywhere in this world. That's why, what was the biggest complaint against Paul and the, uh, sorry, against the, the early New Testament church? In the book of Acts, they said, they turned the whole world upside down. How? How is it possible when you have a group of people that have no political power, it was out, grossly outnumbered, right? They were not connected. They don't have friends in high places. They turned the world upside down. You see, and today, because we've moved away from that, we no longer believe that God has the power to transform. Okay? Because during the times, even of the, uh, the during the periods, right, of uh, we, we talked, about, we seen the history of the great revivals. What happened was this: when the preaching was done, right, the drunks and the wife beaters went back, and they were no longer drunks. They stopped beating their wives. Even during the, that time in England, uh, the Salvation Army, William Booth. 
Now, remember the, the Salvation Army, they're famous for their marching band and their music, right? The background history was this. He would go there as a one-man band. Boom, 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 ba, ba, boom, boom. And he's playing all this music. When? In the back alley at night. And he's making so much noise, right? That the prostitutes and the customers all come out. It's like, who's making all that noise? They come out to see who's, who's the one in the middle of the night doing all this. And then he preaches to them. And what happens? Some no longer patronize those places after they got saved. Others left that lifestyle and profession of prostitution. Today, we don't see that. We don't recognize that even in the organization. They're more famous for their music, their band, and the other things but not this kind of bold, fearless preaching. No wonder we now are so powerless today that we have to now turn to the government, the civil government, to enact righteousness where once the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in every believer takes over and brings out the fruit of righteousness in every, every saint. We no longer believe God can do that anymore. And I put it to you here, part of the problem is this, if the problem begins with us. We have stopped marveling at the power of God to save and then transform someone. We stop believing that this can change and transform an entire city and an entire nation. That now we must instead resort to other devices alright realize this you can pass all sorts of good laws and enforce them and people are still going to die perish and go to hell and what we need to do as New Testament churches in the last days is this, we need to get straight on where the priority is Right? The laws may change, it may even become unfavorable. Guess what? Whatever we do, as we'll continue doing as a full time. Right? Our prayer meetings, we, we pray for this, that, we, that the Lord will continue to allow us in my country to have the liberty to meet the way we meet openly, without fear of persecution, and not to take that freedom for granted, but while we have that freedom, all right, while we have the prosperity in our nation, to make sure that you know we're planting churches and we're supporting the planting of churches and the preaching of the gospel through all nations. Because the day will come, it may change. I don't know when that'll be. We will, we can, and will lose those freedoms. It's a matter of time. Okay, what what, what you're seeing in the Philippines? There's a battle that's on. But understand this, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. Okay? You know, in the... Everyone... I believe in non-discrimination. Everyone deserves a right to be confronted with the gospel. I believe God doesn't discriminate. He says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right? There's none righteous. No, not one. Everyone is wretched. But we have to get things right also. I think we, I, we had members who got offended because I said, look, why are you worried about what two men or two women do when you in church as a man and woman won't even meet each other's needs as husband and wife sure you are father and mother but you're not husband and wife to each other and you sin against each other and then you tell me you want to stand for marriage and you want to affirm marriage how so? Hmm? how so? can men let me ask you the question can you honestly say that yes my wife knows she is loved by me 
that after 20 years of marriage or whatever, 30 years of marriage, you know what? She still knows. Right? That he would rather look at me. That when we're alone in the privacy of our bed, you know what? He appreciates that body. Maybe old. But you know something? She still excites me. Hmm? Ladies, how about you? Because we say we want to stand in a firm marriage, right? Okay. How, how much do you appreciate your husband? Oh, but you don't understand my husband. How I wish he was like brother so and so. You're fantasizing about another man. Uh oh. Hmm? You see, I can preach about all the other stuff and I'll be fine. I deal with all this, this part here. This is where I get into trouble with everyone. Okay, but understand this. Judgment must begin in the house of God. We must, you know, stand on what... I, I, we need to be more concerned about where we stand on what we do, how we live, than what other lost people do because they, lost people are going to do what lost people do. We were like that before we were saved. All right? But the instrument that can change and transform entire nations and societies is here. And this is where we must begin. All right? And, you know, it was where, it was in this area concerning even marriage, what husbands and wives do and all that. Paul wrote in his epistles to tell us, tell us you know, to do those things well, why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. Why? Because you and I can put the word of God and his doctrines to shame by what we're not doing. Right? Men, ladies, are you right with each other as husband and wife? Hmm? Are you walking together with the Lord? Right? Don't be so concerned about all these other stuff if we don't even think that this is important. Okay? But every New Testament church that is scriptural and holding forth the word of God will be deemed as dangerous. That's what Demetrius and all these people understood. It's dangerous. It will hurt their business. But today, as far as the world is concerned, in the majority of cases, they're not worried about us. You know why? We do not pose a threat to anybody. We are so ineffective that we are harmless. Well, sadly, we're harmless. Not only that, now we have become toothless. And that's why now we need all these other weapons to wage our warfare. And we need to go back to picking up the sword of the Spirit. All right? And then, Patiently, lovingly, hold forth these words of life to even the people who hate us. Okay? Whether it's the Sogi bill or anything else, you understand there is a group of people that hate us because whether it's us or others, Christians have been known to be among the most hypocritical and self-righteous people, lacking sometimes in compassion when we need to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's both good news and bad news in the gospel. But we do it sometimes to show how good we are and how unrighteous someone else is. Forgetting that the work of grace in us, in saving us, you know, we were undeserving. We're just wretched creatures. Okay? As we close here, I just want to challenge us about some thoughts. Okay, the day will come that we may have to obey God rather than men. Are you prepared? Okay, that will depend on whether you see this as a conviction or a preference. Which is it? If you feel that you need a majority of people that we must bend together for strength in order to do something or to stand on something, then it is not a conviction. It is merely a preference. You are looking for strength in numbers. 
right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were grossly outnumbered. Daniel stood entirely alone. Okay? The early New Testament church were very, very badly outnumbered. They didn't look for a majority. But they did what they did because it was still the right thing to do. Even if it meant going to prison, even if it meant a death sentence, even if it meant becoming barbecue and lechon, right? it was not negotiable. Now, how convicted are we that the truths of the Bible, the doctrines that we've been taught, okay, are non-negotiable? In other words, okay, your friends cannot ban you your employer cannot get you to change. Mom and dad cannot put pressure on you to change. Right? No man can get you to change because why? If it's the word of God, it's the word of God. Okay? And then do we have a good spirit? Right? And maintain a good testimony before the world. Because I put it to you in, in having to deal with personal evangelism, the thing I found is this, most people have never met a real Christian who truly believes the Bible and will find life's answers from the scriptures. Okay? And when they do, they are genuinely very curious because how is it that you believe this so much and you, 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 know, you, and you're, you know this when the average Christian hardly knows anything at all. Okay? Now this is not about intellectual pride. This is about living by every word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Do you live by that? Right? Sadly, I know I have to confront myself with my own personal inconsistencies. Right? And I believe everyone else of us, everyone has to do that too. Right? So as we close here, let me challenge everyone. Let's take this, these things very seriously. Right, the word of God very seriously, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ very seriously because it can change entire nations if we were to set it loose and unleash it. But understand also that our hope and trust is not in a social movement or political change. The real agent of change right, is going to be found in the agent of the, in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. When he dwells in someone who is saved, Together with the word of God, change begins from the inside. My question today is, is, do you believe it? Are you being continually allowing yourself to be changed and transformed by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit of God? That's your choice. I cannot make you do it. You have to come and allow the Lord, right, by way of personal surrender. That whatever the word of God has to say, you know, our position is always this. Lord, whatever you say, I agree. I allow you. Have your way with me. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this time. Your word. Lord, I thank you for everyone's uh, patience.